we'd like to welcome you to our fireside chat with uh, Adrian Bartel from uh, Sleek, one of the co-founders and chief growth officers. Uh, Adrian, uh, it's great to have you. You guys have been just, you know, firing on all cylinders and just fresh off a $14 million Series A fundraising round. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah, uh, quite quite a year for us at Sleek, and uh, yeah, really happy and uh, and quite uh, yeah happy to be uh, here with you and uh, with all the uh, the attendees. Yeah, we're looking forward to, to hearing your story and uh, talking a little bit more about your growth. Uh, just want to uh, give everyone a, a quick uh, kind of overview of how we do things if you're not used to joining us for a virtual fireside chat. Uh, so we'll do about 30 minutes of a discussion between you and I, and then what we like to do, uh, just like when we do in-person events, uh, which, you know, seemed like ages ago, uh, we like to open up the floor to Q&A uh, and, you know, allow people to have a dialogue. So I put these instructions in the general chat, but if you do have a question for Adrian, uh, hold on to that. We will open up the Q&A function uh, in the Bevy platform a little bit towards the end uh, so you can get your questions ready and then you can ask it there uh, and we will answer it. Or if you'd like, you can just say, I have a question and I will unmute you. And then, uh, you know, you can turn your video or camera on and you can ask Adrian directly. So uh, that's how we like to do things at Startup Grind. Uh, just want to give a quick shout out to all of our partners and sponsors. Um, and, you know, we hope that we can be doing in-person events soon. Uh, this new variant that we've seen emerge uh, in the world, uh, hopefully it does not uh, cause uh, problems as uh, the rest of the world moves towards reopening, but we'd love to be able to go back to doing in-person events, hopefully, uh, fingers crossed, in Q1 2022. So without further ado, uh, let's just dive into it. Uh, so Adrian, uh, you and Julian started Sleek back in 2017, uh, and you're kind of a classic startup story. You saw a problem in the market, uh, you came up with an idea, uh, and you've kind of really gone in there and disrupted and capitalized off of it. Walk us back to the beginning, because you're in a space that was very kind of, uh, for lack of a better term, archaic, kind of uh, convoluted and complex uh, in terms of uh, getting companies set up. And you really came in and uh, were able to revolutionize it and make it very, very easy for people. So walk us back to the beginning when you and Julian were like, hey, I think we can do something here to make everyone's lives easier. Yeah, so thanks a lot for uh, yeah. That's that's a very good introduction, and I think you know the word archaic is actually not strong enough to uh, to to characterize you know the the the, the industry that we're in, uh, like from a structural standpoint, but also from a human standpoint. And you know, like I, I, I'll get back to, on that point and 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 basically present you a bit more on how uh, you know accountants and uh, and basically corporate secretaries envision you know like the. Uh, the customer uh, relation, I mean, the, the relationship with the with the customers. But now let's back. Let's go back to like you know the yeah the, the starting point. So um, before we, like you know launching Sleek with Julien, I was actually like uh, the, the CMO of Luxola and then Sephora. So I was like you know selling lipstick online. I was fortunate enough to be you know in the founding team of uh, of Luxola. So I knew you know how to like solve problems. Uh, the previous one was how to sell makeup and distribute brands uh, throughout Southeast Asia. And very quickly, I realized that actually, as we were opening countries and, uh, you know, incorporating legal entities, uh, there was one common, like, you know, frustration point, And uh, that was the accounting and the admin related, you know, matter. Um, so whether we were in, uh, in Singapore, in, uh, in Indonesia, Malaysia, Australia, Hong Kong, it was always the same thing. Everything was paper based. Everything was slow. And the people I was actually speaking to were like miles away uh, from my conception of, uh, you know, uh, entrepreneurship and you know how to speak to your clients. Uh, you have to listen to your clients. You have to respect him. You have to really like you know follow what they are like you know more or less telling you. And in that case, uh, they were just like telling me, okay, uh, this is our role. Either you stick to it or you know like the door is there. I don't care. You know, and working with you. So um, after a few years of selling, you know, well cosmetics with Sephora, uh, I was looking for another uh, mission, another adventure. And essentially, I, I really realized that actually what was really like you know buzzing me and, and, and the source of frustration back then was the admin. So yeah, I moved from the glamorous you know like uh, industry of uh, cosmetics to the uh, very cockroach, <laughs> let, let's say uh, you know industry of, uh, of admin and corporate. Like. Um, so we're really starting. We really started. So sorry from that pain point. Um, and at first, we really wanted to actually make uh, the incorporation process uh, super easy and uh, you know 100% digital. In Singapore, so that's you know like the very first uh, problem that we that we tackled, uh, like starting in April 2017. Um, in May 2017, we had our MVP and we started to onboard our very first clients. 
And very quickly, although the sort of front end was, uh, you know, like online forms, but the back end was just, you know, copy pasting and us, you know, like uh, working uh, in a bootstrapped way with, of course, like someone that had uh, the necessary licenses. And it, it, it started like that, actually. It started working so, um, like, you know, our clients were looking for an online solution, but also like, you know, a, a good customer experience. Uh, and that's actually like really the DNA that uh, we have at Sleek from the start. It's really to provide you like an, an online experience and then to also like delight you with uh, our client experience. And the yeah. rest after, yeah, it's history, but uh, uh, we have diversified, you know, the, the services that we, uh, that, that we offer to, so to, to our clients in a numerous ways. So we started to do accounting because all our clients were telling us, okay, now I have my legal entity, but who's going to do my bookkeeping? So that's also like how we branched out. And uh, and yeah, and after like a, a series of other services. Yeah, and you know, you talked about earlier how archaic might not be a strong enough word. You know, Singapore has always been one of the easiest places in the world to do business, and actually, they had a company set up. Uh, you know, it's you know compared to other parts of Asia, it's a fairly straightforward and easy process. But there was a lot of different steps you had. You had to have the corporate secretary. You have to go have an accountant. You have to kind of go to a few different areas to make everything happen. And you kind of were able to put that all together. Um, you know, when you guys first started it, uh, how, how, how receptive were clients and how did you go out and get customers uh, to, you know, try the, the platform and, you know, cause basically you're a SaaS company. How did you get them early on? Yeah, so uh, we were a SaaS company. Uh, and I think more importantly, I'm not an accountant. I'm not a lawyer, uh, nor uh, my co-founder was. Uh, so, uh, the like the very very first clients that we that that we actually were that, yeah that actually came on board were people like us so uh, like you know entrepreneurs that uh, didn't want to spend hours like doing their books or like you know uh, harassing chasing sorry their 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 company secretary uh, but people that were looking for efficiency and things uh, you know everything online actually um, so at the very beginning we started with uh, yeah, startups because that's where we had most of our network. And that's where we actually conducted most of our uh, marketing survey actually before launching uh, the development of our MVP. So the 160 people that uh, we interviewed uh, when uh, building uh, the, uh, the thesis and, and the MVP actually were like the 150-ish uh, first clients that we actually onboarded at Sleek. And uh, uh, we did that over yet yeah, the span of uh, two months and a half, three months, and very quickly actually. So that was great to see that uh, despite the lack of a super fancy platform, uh, our clients were looking at uh, yeah, a hundred percent online service and a great customer relationship. Right, and you guys were able to you know scale pretty quickly. I remember uh, talking to your BD head and you know trying to get referrals and you know word of mouth. And I actually have friends that were able to register entities uh, you know when the pandemic broke out uh, on Sleek, and they said it was a very simple and straightforward process. Um, when did you guys really realize that you were onto something? that had the potential to expand beyond Singapore into other markets because two years after launching in Singapore, you guys went to Hong Kong. So I think so. There were like two key moments, I'd say. So the first one was uh, when we realized that uh, uh, we were sending uh, uh, leads to uh, an accounting firm that was in the, in the same street as uh, we were uh, in Singapore, so in Telokaya Street. So uh, there was this small accounting firm next door uh, to whom we were sending our, our leads. Because at the very beginning, we uh, we actually wanted to do like one thing and do it greatly, so registering companies. But after six months of sending you know leads to that uh, other client, and at some point this, I mean, uh, to that other sorry partner, at some point you know this uh, this lady told us, look, I've got I've got too many clients, uh, please stop recommending them to me. So we're like, okay, fine, let's do it uh, you know ourselves. So that's you know how we uh, we went into uh, uh, accounting. And uh, all of a sudden, yes, we, we basically doubled our conversion rates uh, and also the, the average basket, you know, uh, of, of clients coming in. Um, so that was like a, a really interesting moment in terms of like growth in Singapore. And the second one, I think, was uh, when uh, uh, both Singapore-based clients were telling us how, uh, you know, a nightmare uh, Hong Kong management, uh, I mean, Hong Kong companies were. And when also like Hong Kong-based clients were telling us to, uh, you know, like, oh, please come to Hong Kong. It's such a nightmare here. I'm just like, uh, I cannot, uh, you know, uh, stand my corpse like anymore. So that was a point where we were like, okay, fine. There is another opportunity for us there. And more importantly, so we are in Singapore, Hong Kong, now Australia and the UK. So all common low markets. And um, so, you know, rolling out our platform there is um, actually easier than if we were going after a, uh, a market with civilian law. 
such as Indonesia or like you know other uh, other markets. So it was pretty natural, I would say, to extend to expand sorry, in these markets. Uh, although like you know it's not like a, you, you cannot like do, do it in a split of a second, um, but uh, it was more natural actually to go there. And uh, yeah, since then basically the the reception of the uh, Hong Kong market has been like tremendous. Uh, it's a market that is slightly more traditional than uh, than Singapore. So. Uh, we're spending a bit more time actually doing education uh, and telling people that what we're doing is not illegal, that we're heavily regulated, and that obviously, you know, uh, enjoying a 100% digital experience is definitely a right that they have. They, they cannot, you know, like, and they don't have to stick with uh, with paper-based processes. Right. And and how do you get over that, you know, initial skepticism that some people might have? Because, you know, you, know, you talked about you're going into, com you know, markets where common law is applied, uh, mm -hmm. which you know, a natural extension, why Hong Kong or the UK. Um, but, you know, because company registration and compliance is such a heavily regulated thing, uh, how did you get over any initial skepticism that some people had that you weren't regulated or that this is not something uh, that's going to be done kind of on the level and, you know, they might run afoul of any sort of regulations or, you know, do something late and they have to pay a penalty. How do you get beyond that for some uh, people in the early days? That's a very good question. Uh, at the very, very early days in Singapore, like our traditional competitors were telling, uh, you know, their, uh, like, you know, people that we were both uh, engaging uh, to actually uh, acquire as clients, they were telling them that uh, what we were doing was uh, that we're just a bunch of clowns, actually, uh, you know, like trying to launch, uh, again, an online service. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, in response to that, I think, you know, we, uh, we actually used the, the best weapon ever. And it's called, you know, transparency. So we share the knowledge. We share uh, transparency around our our offering, our uh, around our pricing. So there is no hidden fees. That's there won't be any surprises, you know, when uh, when year end comes, uh, uh, as it's often the case actually with traditional, you know, players. So um, and our pricing was also, you know, like an all. I mean, uh, a bit of a, an all you can eat, you know, a sort of, of play. Uh, throughout the year, so it's one flat price, and you can actually do as much you know resolutions or like you know governance operation as you want. So, um, I, I think that transparency and that you know willingness to you know help others uh, definitely made us very competitive and very different compared to the traditional market. So, uh, this way, you know, leads were realizing that uh, uh, what we were doing was not that complex uh, per se, uh, at least not as complex as you know the traditional players were making them you know think it was. Um, the, the traditional, you know, like uh, uh, let's say, CorpSec would tell you, yeah, it's very complicated. That's why you're paying me, you know, two thousand dollars for like issuing your re uh, one resolution. So, uh, and yet it's not. It's uh, you know, uh, very often always the same template that they're using. Sometimes there is a, the need of a, you know a bit of customization, uh, but very. I mean, most of the cases, uh, you don't need to charge uh, two thousand dollars a company to actually run a simple resolution. So, we were explaining that to our leads, to our clients. And thanks to that, they realized that, uh, yeah, we were uh, transparent, we were trustworthy, uh, and at least, you know, they, uh, they, gave it, they gave us a try. That's great. And, uh, you know, it, it's a classic story, really, of you're going into an industry or market where there's, you know, kind of an entrenched mindset, just kind of the, well, this is how it's always been done. Uh, so it's not surprising to hear, you know, it's a classic disruptor model. You know, I, I mean, the one I think of is, you know, a, a ride hailing platform going in and then the taxi drivers in that city, whether it be New York or, or some other part of the world, uh, you know, start saying, oh, they're not doing things the right way. They're not doing things, you know, legally or something like that. And just trying to, you know, resist the change and the disruption. So it, it's a very kind of classic disruptor sort of story, you know, take something that's been done a certain way for a certain period of time that might not be efficient, make it more efficient. And then you start running into to issues and stuff. Um, it, it, you know, so you did Singapore, you did Hong Kong, you're in those common law markets. There's a lot of, you know, territories and countries around the world that are using common law. So there's a really a lot of opportunity for you guys to expand uh, into other markets. Um, walk us through kind of, you know, what your guys' thought process is when you're entering a new market uh, and, you know, kind of what are the conditions that you need to see on the ground uh, in terms of expanding into new arenas? So we first look at, uh, obviously, the, the regulatory framework of the market. Uh, and if, you know, the, the digital signature is approved and accepted by the, by the regulator. So uh, that's the case for all four markets where, where we are. 
Um, so for instance, we could not you know, expand into a, a country such as Malaysia or Indonesia where digital signature is not you know, uh, accepted. So uh, that's the first. And then once you have like, you know, the regulatory green light, uh, then we look at you know, the, the population, the, the, our audience basically. And we prefer to uh, you know, markets where uh, there is a, a high digital savviness. Uh, this way actually, you know, it's easier to actually go after clients uh, and to also like onboard them onto our system. Um, so it's faster actually on, in terms of go to market and in terms of, uh, of traction. Um, so I would say that these are like the three points that, uh, that we, that we look at, you know, when, when expanding and obviously, you know, it needs to make sense from a, uh, I would say a story like perspective, um, like, you know, going from Singapore to the U S would, uh, you know, not mean, <laughs> uh, would not have been a very, you know, like a, a strategic move. Um, but we look at markets that are like a, traditional in the way that they operate and where there is an opportunity so uh, that's how we actually opened hong kong first and then looked at uh, at australia and, and the uk markets where there are like you know a bunch of digital initiatives but not as wise and not as inclusive as you know the, the one that we offer at sleek actually with all our service offering right and you know we've talked about this i'm in uh, taipei taiwan at the moment and you know it's a very traditional market uh, in terms of uh, you know, I guess that digital signature, whether that's accepted by regulators and, and accepted kind of in a legal, uh, you know, kind of framework, uh, that's really kind of one of the key things for you is, you know, in, in terms of uh, if you see a market like maybe Taiwan, for instance, let's just use it as a hypothetical example, um, where, you know, this is something where your service would be very well received and it could help a lot of companies It can actually help foster more startups and more innovation. Do you guys ever see yourself going into a market and saying, hey, you know, going to a regulator and saying, hey, you need to change this and we can help kind of lead that charge where you're almost a change agent to drive that change in the market? Or is that just something where there's probably too much work to go in and kind of advocate for something like that? I think, you know, like, uh, if there is one community that, you know, all startup uh, look at is that that's the time. Um, so you need to be cautious of the time that it takes you to actually grow the time that uh, it takes you to actually open a market and to grow in that market. So, um, when you open a market yourself, you're actually like, you know, in control of that in control of time, uh, although it runs fast. Uh, but if you trust that much, you know, the regulators and, you know, the, uh, the, the part that are related to uh, you know like politics, uh, then you're not in control of time. So uh, I don't think we're at a size yet uh, where we can you know have such a discussion uh, with regulators that haven't embraced the digital you know, uh, uh, you know uh, evolution of their uh, framework. Uh, so yeah, I mean uh, I'm, I'm more than keen to speak to anyone. Uh, but that being said, I would not you know like uh, uh, base my strategy at this point in time. Uh, on a hypothetic, you know, like uh, uh, changes in regulations, uh, unfortunately, I cannot. Right. And how, how important is a, a healthy startup ecosystem to those new markets where you're launching? Um, you know, is, is that really kind of key if there's an emergence of startups and a new startup hub, for instance? Uh, is, is that something that's a really key factor or is it more just, uh, you know, just that framework needs to be simplified or digitized more? Is that more yeah. important? If we look at the startup ecosystem, for instance, in, in, in Hong Kong or, or, or Singapore, Hong Kong, for instance, um, the, uh, the, the, I mean, the, the, the economic board actually claims that there are like 3,500 startups in Hong Kong. That's great. That's big, right, you know, from the ecosystem. But when you look at it uh, as a whole, compared to like, the, like the, the quantity of companies that are currently actively operating in Hong Kong, that's... Uh, very very small uh, and that's not a market in itself where you can just like you know grow and thrive and uh, and have a sustainable business so no traditionally we we look at startups at the very very beginning of uh, our growth uh, because these guys are tech savvy uh, they're you know keen to embrace like your digital solutions after like you know going through the nightmare of, uh, of paperwork like of paper-based processes but at the end of the day they're not a core persona the, the the sleek main persona is actually the sme uh, or like, you know, the, the, yeah, the small business owner that just like wants to spend less time uh, doing its books uh, or doing its accounting or chasing again, like, his or her company secretary and someone that's really like, you know, wants more time to actually build uh, his business or, you know, speak to its, uh, to its customers. Um, so it's not the startupers, uh, although we really love that space and we have like plenty of uh, really crazy and super cool clients that, uh, that are building like exciting stuff. 
Uh, it's great from a marketing standpoint because these are like some amazing stories, but um, I have to be transparent. It's not our, uh, our core business. Our core business is really SME and small business owners. Right. And that's pretty interesting because, you know, you're really coming in and, you know, the, the, the kind of the sales pitch or the elevator pitch, so to speak, is, you know, we not only save you time, but, you know, money, it, it, it's a more affordable service as well. So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds. That, that's correct. And uh, if you look at our pricing, we're not the cheapest on the market in Singapore or Hong Kong. Uh, we uh, provide uh, great services at a decent pricing and quite, uh, you know, competitive. Uh, but uh, we don't want to enter into a price war, uh, given that uh, if you're too much after, you know, like a uh, lower price, you don't really care about the quality. So it would not be, you know, like a, a fair to just like, you know, strip down our, our pricing just for the sake of, you know, onboarding you as a client. And then after providing you, you know, average services. Uh, other people in the market actually do such a thing. We don't. Uh, we really want to maintain a high level of happiness and, uh, you know, flat prices at a competitive level, obviously. Right. Um, walk us through, uh, you know, so you guys have, have been on operation about four years now, uh, just closed a $14 million series, a round of funding, which was literally just announced a few, uh, a week or two ago, basically. Uh, and congratulations on that. Um, when Thanks. you were going out there and doing the fundraising, uh, you know, cause that's an experience that we'd like to talk about at startup Prime because there's really no playbook for it. It's, it's, you know, you have to really kind of go through it to really get how it's done. What was that experience like? And, and when did you and Julian kind of sit down and say, yeah, this is the right time to actually start to go out and have these discussions and start the fundraising process? And I guess also, when was that time when you guys sat down? Like, what was the timeline like? I think that, I mean, I'm just going to say like, uh, blow up an open door, as we say in French, but uh, there is not, you know, like good or bad time to, uh, to do fundraising. Uh, yeah. If there is one thing that I've learned over this, you know, past four years, it's just that you continuously, you know, have ongoing discussions. Um, so with, you know, firms or individuals at the very beginning, and, you know, when there is an interest, uh, uh, you know, by more than one person, and when on the other side, you're after to, you, you're, you know, about to enter into like a new phase of growth, then there is like, you know, a discussion that needs to happen between both sides. Um, otherwise, it's more like, a, like flirting, I would say. Uh, you just need to spend a bit of time to see, uh, you know, whether these guys are the right partners uh, and also for you to provide the necessary arguments so that, you know, there is a mutual interest in actually pursuing something together. Uh, so I'd say that, yeah, it's a continuous discussion. There is not one moment where you're like, okay, fine, let's, uh, let's raise that money. It's more like a process that uh, actually have you to build your, your project and, uh, and your next, you know, like milestones. And then on the side, discussions that happen and that actually help you also to you know build your uh, your process your project and the milestones uh, that, that actually go come along with it right and you know when uh you started out you know so i think you brought up a good point is that the fundraising process it's it's kind of an ongoing thing and it's not okay now we're going to go start and have discussions it's it's something where you know you're having those discussions almost continuously whether or not you're meeting people at a networking event or you're approaching them or maybe they came to you and said, Hey, you know, we, we, we like what you're doing. Um, did you get anybody that actually knocked on your door and said, you know, Hey, we, we like what you're doing, you know, let us know when you're fundraising or are you guys interested in taking outside money? So we were fortunate to, yes, have a few people that uh, did such a thing, but uh, it, it, it does not happen, you know, like uh, all of a sudden like that, uh, someone looks at your door and in a one sky call, boom, it, it's done. No, it's uh, it's much longer than that. Uh, but yeah, like, um, so my take on that is you just need to speak to anyone uh, and to just like, you know, present your idea to anyone to also get feedback. Uh, if, you know, like 90% of uh, the, the, the VCs or the angel investors that you speak to are not interested by your project itself, perhaps you need to like adjust a few things or at least, you know, listen to what they tell you. Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's a two-way street. So you need to present, you need to just like connect with as many people as, uh, as you can or as you want. Uh, and then on the other end, yes, there will be like people interested, people that will just say, okay, next time, or people that will say no, but uh, I guess, you know, like there is, yeah, um, things to learn from all these questions and yeah, good feedbacks. Yeah. And for your series A round, what was the amount of time that it took to, you know, kind of when you quote unquote kicked off the, the fundraising round to when, you know, everything was kind of done and announced? Uh, what was that sort of time frame like? Because this is something that a lot of startups kind of struggle with, like, 
how long it's going to take. You know, some think will take three months, six months, and it takes nine months in some cases. You know, it can kind of go either way. It took us roughly six to seven months in between the moment that we started to share the, the data room and uh, and yeah, the, the the PR announcement, which is like the very, very end of uh, the whole process. Right. Excellent. Yeah. Um, I'm going to open up the floor to Q&A uh, now. So if you guys have questions, um, Q&A is open. So if you look at your tab on the right in Bevy, uh, and oh, I see uh, much. I, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm getting your name wrong, but Masiej, uh, who has a, a question um, from uh, the co-founder of C-Shark. Uh, you know, so we, we actually know Christine very well. They're one of our partners. Uh, and everything so uh oh it's like magic he's uh he uh, yeah magic <laughs> so um but yeah so q a we've got a lot uh going on uh so yeah if you have uh bevy open just look in the q a section and put your question there um so the uh magic actually has six questions uh what was your r d product journey was it through market research discovery mvp poc or a bit more organic uh, which I think we kind of talked about that earlier. Uh, let's tackle this one. What are the biggest issues you are encountering when getting into new jurisdictions when expanding globally, except for the obvious law policy differences? I'd say the the, the people. Uh, you really need to have like people that. Uh, I mean, we're we're in a very traditional uh, industry. So uh, first, like you know, uh, hiring people that uh, uh, were in line with uh, our digital you know, aspirations. Uh, and people that wanted to change the way they, they had been operating, uh, operating for sometimes more than 10 years actually is extremely difficult. Uh, so I'd say that, yes, uh, yeah, I don't think it's an issue. I think it's a, it's a big challenge uh, to really find the right people to, uh, yeah, to embark on this new journey. Right. And let's see, where is your software development workforce base? And are you thinking of diversifying? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. You know, COVID has kind of taught us that you can really have teams anywhere. Um, are they all in Singapore or do you have teams elsewhere? So we started with uh, Singapore. So this is where uh, our CTO, uh, our product CPO and a lot of product people are. But now we also have like many people in the Philippines, in Vietnam, uh, some in India. Um, so yeah, we're a bit of a decentralized organization now. Uh, because or thanks to COVID, it depends you know, uh, which sites you are. Yeah, and that kind of leads to another question about... Uh, you know, expanding into different verticals, uh, you know, EOR services, employer of record, uh, you know, is really a big space to be in right now. Uh, so Magic has, uh, are you planning more integrations with invoicing, HR, management, banks, and ERPs uh, for your product? Yeah, so the invoicing part is already covered by uh, the, the accounting software that, uh, that we provide, uh, to the accounting solution that we provide to our clients. On the HR side as well, uh, we have an integration with uh, so a solution that does payroll, uh, and they also like you know uh, manage the leads. On banks, so we're very happy. So we launched uh, a month ago our business account in Singapore. So today uh, on on Slick Singapore, you can register a company and get a business account open, you know, like right uh, at the same time. So uh, in other words, you can go from an idea to an operating company in just like one day. Uh, from one same platform, so they need to again, you know, like uh, start uh, two or three processes with the same KYCs, the same question being asked to you, and so on. Uh, so everything is under one roof, uh, and we will shortly like give you a, a Mastercard payment uh, card uh, with that, so that you can literally like you know uh, start paying, uh, you know, from uh, from day one. Uh, for ERPs, it's a bit um, not very much aligned with you know like our personas. Our clients are really small companies, so uh, ERPs are very, very often actually like uh, way too advanced for them. Uh, I think, you know, uh, if G Suite, for instance, was considered as an ERP, that would be like, you know, the level that uh, that they are at uh, at this point in time. Right. Uh, going back to s some of the other questions here. Uh, oh, yeah. Magic says, we see business accounts being released a few weeks back, making the service almost end-to-end. Uh, -end. Uh, can you shed some light on some of the other features you are, are planning on releasing? Yeah, so I mean, uh, we're looking at the classical and main features such as yeah, the, so the, the payment cards that will be live uh, very, very shortly. And then after, yes, uh, remittance solutions uh, should, uh, should come up also like uh, relatively soon, uh, slightly after the cards. Right. 
And and final question uh, for Magic: uh, Are you planning public investment rounds in the future, perhaps for your clients? So I guess that is, you know, beyond the Series A. That that's an interesting question. We uh, we were very very fortunate to see you know like a few clients actually willing to uh, to have the same discussion as uh, as Massiège. Uh, so thanks for the question. Um, but unfortunately, right now we're at a stage where uh, it would be a bit difficult. Uh, however, we're cooking something uh, along these lines of you know like uh, investment and angel investing, uh, but uh, probably I mean, with more diversity of portfolio than than just like you know us as a company. So all stay right. tuned. Stay tuned, indeed. Uh, all right. So uh, yeah, Magic says great stuff. Thank you, Adrian. Uh, Going to jump over to the Q and A. Uh, so we have uh, Johan uh, Marinus from the Netherlands uh, joining us. Um, so uh, thanks for uh, tuning in from the, oh gosh, uh, let's see. Uh, all right, I got the question there. Um, thank you very much for joining and sharing your story. You already talked about your first clients being receptive to work 100% online and the local acceptance of the digital signature, but surely the government licensing authorities had to be ready also. Were they completely ready or did you have to work with them to streamline those processes in the, mar uh, in the markets that you're in? Uh, related to that, apart from Singapore and Hong Kong, which are among the most developed Asian countries, have you considered or are you considering any other Southeast Asian countries? Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And congratulations with your success. All right. So first question regarding so the, uh, um, yeah, the government slash licensing authorities, uh, if yeah. they were completely ready. Yes, uh, we did not reinvent the wheel. Uh, we sticked completely to the rules and to the regulatory framework that uh, was open back then. Uh, we're licensed and regulated so uh, we get audited quite you know regularly so we cannot you know uh, uh, cross the line so uh, i have like very very good compliance people that are telling us exactly what we cannot do um so yeah we stick to it so yes yeah. uh, we were very lucky everything was ready uh, we uh, just evolved in a nicer framework all right and the second part of that uh, related apart from singapore and hong kong uh which are very developed in asia have you considered or are you considering any other southeast asian countries at this point in time no because again so the regulatory framework of these markets uh does not allow actually the the digital signature uh for everything um so we prefer to actually focus on on markets that uh, were accepting that and that were slightly more uh, tech savvy uh, such as australia uh, and we decided to branch out to the uk uh, as it's really also a vibrant market and a, and a good opportunity for us. All right. So, yeah, that's uh, Johans has, uh, I hope we answered your question uh, there. So we're doing Q&A right now. So if you have a question, uh, just go to the Q&A. Uh, I can also unmute uh, anybody that wants to ask one live. So you don't need to type it out necessarily. You can just chime in there and say, hey, I got a question for Adrian. I'd like to, to ask him live. Um, but, you know, Johans uh, did bring up a pretty good point, I think, uh, you know, uh, with with those those kind of markets that you're entering, you know, like you said, you didn't need to reinvent the wheel into these markets. And there's other markets and, you know, there's markets, I mean, all over Singapore, uh, around Singapore and Southeast Asia or, you know, even in uh, the rest of Asia that could benefit from this. But if, if the regulatory framework is not there and digital signatures aren't allowed, you don't want to necessarily kind of bang your head against the wall trying to, to enact change, you're really kind of concentrating and focus on markets where you can go in and enter right away exactly. without having to reinvent the wheel. Completely. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and again, uh, you don't have much time, so it's better to just like focus on opportunities that are uh, worth it and that you can really transform rather than to sit and wait you know, for the change to happen in front of you. Right. Um, I want to talk uh, while you know we're waiting for, for other questions to come in. Um, I want to talk about, you know, just kind of like the team and the culture uh, that you guys have. Um, you know, you talked about having some operations and some people in the Philippines, you know, you've got operations in Singapore, Hong Kong, and some other markets now. How big is the team? Uh, and how much of that is based in Singapore? And how do you kind of keep everyone together, even though, you know, we've been working from home or across different time zones uh, virtually uh, during this COVID period? Very good question. Uh, so we are approximately 200 people. Uh, of this, 80 to 90 are based in Singapore, and the rest is yes, so we have quite a, a big, uh, a big, uh, a big subsidiary in the Philippines, and then the rest is we have we're 15 people here in Hong Kong, 
and then the rest is actually scattered like across Southeast Asia and also within Europe. Um, so culture-wise, we uh, live and breathe the slick values. So S for simplicity, L for learning, E for entrepreneurship, E for excellence, and K for kindness. So in other words, we like to make mistakes and to learn from it. And we like to also, you know, be kind to uh, uh, each other, to our clients. We're, we're basically the good guys on the market. We're transparent. We're here to really like help you. And we'll go the extra mile to make this happen. Um, and I think, you know, like it's really like a common DNA that we uh, really, uh, you know, spread or at least, you know, we gathered people that, uh, you know, had the same DNA across, yes, so two continents, Asia and Europe. Um, and to go back to your question on like, you know, working remotely, uh, I was not a particular fan actually of, uh, you know, like a uh, remote work before COVID. I was constrained uh, and, and I had to work like that. I was a bit scared by the, you know, the, the response um, from family. I thought that, you know, they would uh, not be working from home, that they would play more time, you know, playing PlayStation or, I don't know, like the, going out and so on. It didn't happen. Everyone was like so responsible and it did not feel like everybody was like from home from one. Other, actually, this material is very easy because we're an entirely paperless, so everything is in the cloud. So, when we had to do such a thing, everybody left with uh, the monitor, the laptop, and uh, well, uh, from the day after, we were just like you know, operating like uh, like any other day. Um, and I think to that regard, uh, it's it's it's. I mean, thanks to the mainly thanks to the value that we had of like we really helping each other, being there for the others, and, and listening. Uh, that we actually have to have uh, everyone working from home individually, but we like, you know, working and collaborating as a team. Uh, so that was very, very uh, an amazing discovery that we made just uh, in, in April 2020 when uh, everybody had to just like, you know, rush home. And, uh, and yeah, and as you know, right now, uh, we doubled, if not more, like the, the team size. I haven't seen my co founder for, uh, let's say, a year and a half. Uh, like, I mean, working on a daily basis with uh, six different people that, like in Singapore that I haven't ever met, you know, like uh, in person. Um, mm -hmm. So next week, I'm due to uh, fly to Singapore and knock on some wood uh, that, uh, you know, the rules are not changing to actually meet all of them. So that's really going to be nice to actually meet, uh, meet them for the first time. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah, yeah go for things. In, you're not in Singapore right now. Where are you? No, uh, I'm, I'm actually based in, uh, in Hong Kong. Oh, okay. Oh, you're based in Hong Kong. Okay. So, Correct, yeah. Yes. I mean, yeah, so you're you're finally uh, gonna go, you know, see Julian after a year and a half. It's 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 been pretty wild. There's a lot of startups and a lot of companies that have have gone through something like this. But I wanted to ask you uh, what the effect of COVID and this pandemic has been on your business. Uh, you know, we've you know we can kind of talk about it in two different ways. What was the effect on in terms of growth of the business? Did it really negatively impact you? And I don't think it did from the sounds of it. And then secondly was the fundraising. You know, when we had the pandemic break out, we had, you know, we talked to one or two VCs, uh, did a startup Brian fireside chat kind of at the onset of this uh, global pandemic and crisis. And what we've seen in that last year and a half is there's been no slowdown in fundraising whatsoever. I mean, VCs are still deploying capital uh, kind of at record rates. So I guess, you know, the, the, the question is twofold. What was the impact on the business, uh, you know, from COVID, and did, did that also have any impact adversely on the fundraising side? So, with regard to our growth, uh, I'd say two things. So the first one is, uh, uh, like, when the first lockdowns actually happened uh, in uh, in Singapore and also here in Hong Kong, uh, all accountants were blocked at home. They could not go back to their office where they had like, you know, stacks of paper, all the receipts to actually, you know, like process the bookkeeping of companies. So many, many, many companies were basically blocked in their accounting operations uh, for one good reason. Everybody was working from home and uh, you, you will never see accountants, you know, bringing boxes of uh, receipts uh, home so that they can actually do their job. Um, so that's where it, it started to be really interesting uh, uh, we had like some in interesting, you know, like inquiries of people that were looking for an alternative, although they had been working for like, you know, five to 10 years with these very traditional players. So they were looking at something else, something that would, that was digital, something that was more like, you know, sticking to their daily routine of like, you know, uh, just uh, waking up, having breakfast and just like opening their laptop and working from uh, their sofa, from their uh, living room the, the, the whole day. So that was the start of like new discussions with people that, uh, uh, we were not speaking before, so traditional SMEs and people that were not necessarily looking for alternative. 
And then second, uh, while everyone was actually blocked at home, uh, a lot of people came up with, uh, you know, entrepreneurial ideas. Um, so it was finally the time that, uh, I mean, they had like, you know, some spare time to actually, you know, work on this uh, uh, great, you know, like uh, uh, e-commerce idea of like, you know, watch, uh, watch uh, wristbands that they had for like, you know, five to 10 years. And finally, they actually started that. So we had also many, many, you know, solopreneurs um, or aspiring entrepreneurs that finally started their project. Uh, and actually, we saw that uh, really like just, we saw a surge uh, during COVID. We also saw, so that's more like a negative part, but like people that uh, um, whose employment was actually terminated in big corporations, in big companies, such as the airlines or like, you know, the, the F&B or hotel industry that actually started their own stuff. So we really helped all these guys to actually start their entrepreneurial journey. So that was hugely rewarding. And we have like plenty of really amazing stories to tell. Um, that's you know, the growth part. And then when it comes to like the, the, the VC, uh, then I'd say that, yes, uh, because everyone has been like, you know, blocked at home and everyone has never worked that much uh, in terms of intensity. Obviously, there are like plenty of deals for them. Um, and I don't think, you know, it has slowed us down. Um, and I think, yeah, the, the discussions that we had were pretty natural, if not more, uh, because we were all like, you know, living the same uh, experience of working from home, of like uh, not seeing, you know, our teams for, for quite some time. Um, so, yeah, like I would not say that it, it created more, uh, I mean, it facilitated the discussions or it made them more difficult. It was just pretty much, you know, like uh, uh, we were speaking equal to equal, I would say. Yeah, and I think it's, uh, you know, you brought up a point about solopreneurs or entrepreneurs finally enacting or starting their idea and registering their businesses. And, you know, I remember hearing a few stories of individuals that, you know, lost their uh, employment passes or work visas, depending on where they were, uh, and, you know, basically being forced to almost kind of do that because, you know, they didn't necessarily want to leave Singapore wherever they were living. Uh, and a lot of people just doing that and actually sort of taking the plunge and, and starting their businesses so that they could uh, remain wherever they were. Um, so, yeah, that's a, a very interesting point you brought up. Uh, Sanjeev Kumar uh, has a question. Uh, how is the scope of expansion in ANZ? I mean, the scope of expansion. Uh... Yeah. So you guys are already in Australia. So uh, I guess uh, New Zealand, is that another market that you could potentially be looking at or? At the moment, we are only looking at Australia. Uh, if there is one thing that we do well at Stick, it's to be pragmatic and to, uh, you know, like uh, do one step at a time. So right now we're looking at Australia. We would, uh, you know, happily look at our uh, uh, Kiwi friends uh, very shortly, but right now the focus is on uh, is on Australia only. Right. Uh, Johannes has, uh, or Johans, uh, Johan or Johannes, uh, you can tell me if I'm getting that wrong in the, in the chat there, but uh, from the Netherlands uh, has an, uh, a couple of questions. Uh, Yo, okay, I guess I am getting it right. <laughs> um, what percentage would you say is tech staff uh, for your staff and what percentage are business service providers, meaning lawyers, accountants, et cetera, when you look at your workforce? So it's like 40, 40 for the tech and the, and the operations and then 20% for the, uh, the, the yeah, marketing and sales and, uh, and HR. Got it. Okay, hope that answers uh, your question, Johansa. Uh, we're taking Q&A right now um, with Adrian. So if you have uh, a question, just give it a shout out. You can type it. You can say, hey, Curtis, I'd like to talk to Adrian directly and ask the question and I can unmute you, which, uh, you know, we, we like doing sometimes because uh, it makes us feel like we're doing in-person events again where we pass the microphone around. Um, but yeah, if uh, anyone's got a question, please uh, drop it in there. We're kind of getting towards the end of the, the time for the event. So uh, if you're not sure, definitely ask the question so that you, you get it in. Um, but I think yeah, we pretty much kind of covered uh, Johan's question. Oh, we got somebody else. Uh, Sanjay says, great session. Thank you. And we're glad you enjoyed it, Sanjay. Um, but I think we kind of covered most of what Johan's had had to say. Uh, let's see. Um, in terms of like your staff and your workforce. So I think we, we kind of got that all covered there. Um, yeah, he says 40% tech, 40% operations, 20% S&M, I guess is, uh, he's just clarifying. Marketing, yeah. yeah, perfect. So, um, okay. looks like we got, 
<laughs> I guess Magic and Johans are, are are having a little competition in terms of the number of questions that they're they're asking you. <laughs> so uh, it's good to see some healthy competition uh, at startup Brian. But if uh, there's no more questions, up uh, uh, there you are, Adrian. I think Monsieur actually has a has a question. Yeah, uh, Magic, you got a question? He says cooperation, so. <laughs> he says, I know you said you're targeting small business, but what do you do? What do you think of an offering for startups pre-seed? Um, I'd say that our pricing is already like very competitive. So if we go any lower then, uh, and if you start, you know, like raising rounds and uh, issuing shares and so on, then the quality, uh, I mean, might not be there, or at least, you know, we will be in a tough position to actually make it happen. Uh, uh, in due time with the, the, like, you know, the expected level of quality. But uh, I'm more than happy to like, discuss with you uh, if, uh, if you think we should actually you know, like, uh, move the lines to make it happen. So uh, connect, let's connect on LinkedIn. For sure, yeah. And uh, definitely follow Sleek on LinkedIn and Adrian and Julian uh, if you can. Um, you know, I, I remember when they launched it and you know, to, to see the $14 million Series A round of funding, which is a very healthy Series A round for, uh, you know, a tech startup in, in Southeast Asia. Um, you know, you guys are just clicking on all cylinders and, uh, you know, you're kind of taking over the world in, in, in some ways, uh, you know, one country. Uh, let's just stay down to earth. But, uh... <laughs> <laughs> but you know, maybe, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what the future holds and uh, hope to have you back at Startup Grind to talk about growth sometime down the line. We, we have had people you know, kind of very early in their entrepreneurial journey, come to Startup Grind and, and share their story. And then, you know, five years later, they're a unicorn or, uh, you know, we've had had a couple of uh, speakers over the years turn into unicorns or, you know, have exits and everything. And, you know, it's always good to kind of get them to come back and, and share what, uh, you know, what that was like. So, um, but Adrian, uh, it looks like, uh, I think that's all the questions. Uh, everyone's saying thank you for, for all the insights and for the session. And we do appreciate your time. Uh, we wish you all Thanks the best. So and, uh, you know, let us know uh, how uh, we can be of help to you guys as you continue growing and scaling. Thank you so much. I mean, just, uh, you know, keep on producing great content. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan and a big consumer. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you so much. So. Uh, yep. Thanks, everyone. And uh, we hope everyone has a great evening wherever you are joining us in the world. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you, Curtis. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.